A while back, I found myself sitting backstage at a comedy club in San Diego. I was opening all weekend for Norm MacDonald. It was also my job to go up and close out the night after he finished his set. If you told me at 14 that this was something I'd be doing one day, I'd probably be legitimately hurt by the intricacy and personalization of your joke. You see, I was and am a comedy nerd. I was a comedy nerd before it was cool to be an anything nerd. Before Comic Con was a hub of pop culture and the word nerd meant more Kimmy Gibbler and less Zoe Deschanel. Back when someone holding a banana like a gun was still considered edgy. We didn't have Netflix or YouTube. Hell, we didn't have the internet. I had to tape my favorite shows or sneak down the stairs after my mom was asleep to watch Conan or Letterman and hope that she wouldn't wake up when I laughed crazily at Triumph the Insult Comic Dog or Rupert G always on the verge of getting knocked out. Amongst my small group of friends, you had to know what happened on last night's talk shows. And while regaling the hilariousness of Andy Richter getting fake murdered on last night's show, you'd see Danielle walk by with the cool kids and know your path would be a lonely one. That was fine. Being uncool meant I could focus a lot more time on comedy, and I knew everything there was to know about it. From Buster Keaton to Mr. Show with Bob and David, this was my world. When I started doing stand-up in 2010, I knew exactly what I wanted to do and how to accomplish it. Of course, just like everyone, I had my struggles from the very beginning. Getting on stage alone in front of a room full of people who've already made three assumptions about you before you've said a word and then try to make them laugh is downright horrific. But I persevered, worked hard, and started doing shows with the people I'd idolized growing up, like David Tell, Maria Bamford, and Scott Thompson from Kids in the Hall. Adding Norm MacDonald to that list was like performing with the vice president of stand-up. He was one of the most brilliant and respected performers in the world of comedy. I started my career as a sketch comedian, mainly because of my love for Monty Python and Saturday Night Live. Having come of age during Norm's tenure on Weekend Update and now getting to hang out with him, drink coffee, and talk about the history of comedy was incredible. You see, these are the things that happen while out in the main room drunks are cackling, heckling, and eating chicken strips. A backstage for stand-up comics is not like a backstage for musicians. There are rarely drugs. Or women. There's half-eaten nachos everywhere, and it's quiet. It's kind of our escape from everything. Despite what you might think, stand-up is a lonely job. It, of course, requires the participation of dozens, sometimes hundreds of people, but what we put ourselves through to get one laugh takes a toll. You need backstage to breathe. We're a lonely breed that craves attention only to immediately shun it. We're idiots. <laughs> Norm got his light, letting me know he was wrapping up and I'd have to go give the end of the show announcements. When the club manager burst in the room and said five words I'll never forget as long as I live, Steve Martin just walked in. I laughed it off as some kind of weird joke. But then he followed it up with, Steve Martin just walked in and Paul Simon is parking the car. <laughs> the second sentence somehow made this whole thing much more believable. <laughs> as if I'd always known Paul Simon was the better driver or something. I mean, Paul Simon and Steve Martin were best friends. They had strong SNL ties. Norm was on SNL, so this whole, th wait, hold Steve Martin is here? The manager assures me this isn't a joke, and before I have time to react, I hear Norm say goodnight. So I hustle out on stage to say my goodbyes and drive safes, and I immediately start scanning the audience for Paul Simon and Steve Martin. The lights come up, and sure enough, there they were sitting in the very back. These days, it's almost impossible to tell someone that someone is the greatest or that something is literally the best ever because it's such a saturated proclamation. However, what I'm about to say contains no use of hyperbole and no measure of exaggeration within. Steve Martin is the reason I started performing on stage. He was the sole motivation for me to be in front of someone else and make them smile. When I was 10 years old, I saw Three Amigos and I peed my pants. <laughs> When I was 12, I saw L.A. Story, and it blew my mind that someone could write, direct, and star in a movie all at once. When I was 14, I saw The Jerk, and for the first time ever understood what I wanted to do with my life. If Norm was the vice president of comedy, then Steve Martin was Abraham goddamn Lincoln. He was the man who changed the game and shaped everything that followed. If I was ever seriously dating someone, she would have to watch My Blue Heaven. And if she didn't laugh at least once, she was taken out of consideration as a life partner. That's not a joke. To say Steve Martin influenced everything I do would almost be an insult to Steve Martin, but it's true. I never imagined I'd ever get to meet him, let alone be in the same room with the man. I mean, for God's sakes, his best friend is believed by many to be the greatest living American songwriter, and now they were both a hundred feet away from me. As I made the short trek from the stage to backstage, I thought to myself, this is going to be awesome. 
I mean, Steve and Norm have to be friends. Why else would he be here? Of course, Steve Martin had just written a new musical with Edie Burkell, and it was opening at the Old Globe in San Diego, so the fact that they were in the same city made sense. But why on earth would he drive downtown to a little club to watch stand-up if he didn't know Norm? In my head, Steve Martin will come backstage, he and Norm will decide to go get drinks, and then we'll all be invited. This will be the greatest night of my life. Well, the night of my daughter's birth, then this. The night of my daughter's birth, first time I touched a boob in seventh grade, then this. When I get backstage, Norm is pacing. He has no idea why Steve Martin is here. And I say, probably to see you. And then he chuckles. I then offered to go get him. And Norm said, yeah, go get Steve and tell him I want to say hi. As I walked through the club, it started to sink in that Norm McDonald just asked me to go get Steve Martin and bring him backstage. I was in a parallel universe. Nothing mattered ever anymore, and everyone looked like manatees. <laughs> I was sweating a lot, but I approached. Steve Martin sat drinking a glass of wine. He wore a fedora tilted forward just a tad and a suit jacket that probably cost more than my car. I didn't know what to say because I've always avoided meeting my heroes, mainly because I always want them to be who they are in my head, and that's impossible. I spent years collecting thoughts and opinions on who Steve Martin was. In my head, he was the thoughtful, considerate dad in parenthood, or the witty, charming hero in Roxanne. Problem is, what if he's a jerk, a real one? <laughs> it's a coin flip that I never wanted to toss. Also, I never know what to say to my heroes. I mean, what do you say to someone who shaped your comic sensibilities and timing? Thank you? That seems appropriate. But here I had something to say, a clear objective, get him backstage. So I started with, excuse me, Mr. Martin, Norm would love it if you'd come backstage so he could say hello. He turned to me and said, oh, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I froze. Did I say something I didn't think I said? Was that whole manatee thing out loud? Did Norm set me up? Do these two hate each other? Should I die? <laughs> he broke the silence. I'm kidding. Let's go. <laughs> Goddamn genius. <laughs> I walked Steve Martin, Paul Simon, Edie Brickell, and a few other people backstage. As soon as we got there, I texted my wife. She's a huge Paul Simon fan. In fact, we have a cat named Simon after Paul Simon. There was a Garfunkel, but he died. <laughs> she was flipping out. She couldn't believe what was happening, and honestly, neither could I. I just kept staring at Steve Martin. He was so relaxed, so cool, so confident. He knew he was the most important person in the room, and it meant nothing to him. This is a guy who has reached the finish line in a field of entertainment that doesn't have one. He started introducing himself, as if any of us needed the introduction, but he carried on nonetheless. By the time he got to me, some guy standing next to me blurted out, Hey, Dallas is really funny. I was laughing the whole time. The man sitting next to me was Steve Martin's nephew. And Steve replied with, Oh, really? Why don't you tell us a joke? <laughs> I felt like I'd just ridden every roller coaster at the same time. Don't you hate it when people ask you to do that, Steve said. I haven't told a joke in 30 years and people still ask me. The room felt the relief of a thousand farts and we moved on. <laughs> then Steve looked at Norm and I thought, here it comes, we're all going out and becoming best friends. There was a short pause and Norm asked, what are you doing in San Diego? Steve told him that he was in town for the, the new musical he'd written. Then there was another pause, much longer this time. And then Norm asked, how do you write a musical? Oh, God. Norm was geeking out. He also had no idea what to say to Steve Martin. He was just as nervous and in love as we were. It was over. We weren't going out. We weren't going to be best friends. And from the conversation that began to unravel, it seemed like Norm and Steve didn't even know each other. Norm's assistant mercifully broke up the conversation with, let's all get a picture, to which Norm replied, God, yes. <laughs> I asked Norm's assistant if she could take one with my phone, and she obliged. When I handed my phone over, Steve Martin made fun of how old it was, and after the photo was taken, he asked to see it. 
The picture looked terrible. It was grainy and dark, and Steve yelled out, eh, it's a gross picture. How old is this iPhone? Jeez. Hey, let's take another one, and this time, Paul, you get in. You know, Paul Simon, because he was just standing there. <laughs> Everyone agreed this was a great idea, except for Paul Simon. The only way he could have expressed how much he didn't want to be in this picture more was if he yelled, no, and ran out of the room. <laughs> However, Steve convinced him, and he looks really excited. <laughs> then Steve took my phone and asked, what's wrong with this? I told him it was old and that the camera sucked, and he started just taking pictures of things. <laughs> then he looked at the photos, and he didn't like them, so he spit on the back of the phone, wiped it on his leg, and said, hey, let's take one of those selfies, to which I replied, of course we should do that. So we did. Then Steve just started talking about stand-up. He started telling us stories about old times and jokes he'd written and new jokes he wished he'd write at some point. And for the first time in my life, I felt my heart flutter. <laughs> he began telling this long story about a road gig he'd done in the late 70s. Everyone ears, everyone's ears were glued, and we couldn't wait for this story to pay off with some amazingly brilliant joke. But it didn't. <laughs> he just ended the story. <laughs> everyone stood there in silence. And then Steve said, that's it. That's, that's the end of the story, sorry. Didn't I mention that I don't tell jokes anymore? The room howled. He was the master of the room. After a little while, things started to calm down and I could tell they were getting ready to head out. So I turned to Paul Simon. Uh, Mr. Simon, you have no idea how big a fan my wife is of your music. Of course, I also think you're amazing, but she's a big, big fan. He said, thank you. And I, for some reason, felt like he didn't understand what I was trying to tell him. So I said, we have a cat named Simon, and it's after you. We used to have a Garfunkel, but he died. <laughs> Paul Simon looked at me blankly for a solid two seconds. Then he turned and walked away. <laughs> Not far, mind you, about four feet away, and then sat on a chair by himself. I turned around and saw Steve Martin ready to head out, so I naturally walked him to the elevator. On the way there, I was just thinking about what had just happened, that he came backstage and hung out. It wasn't a meet and greet, it wasn't an appearance, it was a hangout. He wanted to talk comedy with comedians, and he made Paul Simon wait around while he did it. <laughs> this is something comics do all the time. It's almost exhausting. We love to sit around and talk comedy and tell jokes and talk about who's great right now and who's hack, and we can do it for hours. It's why my wife stopped coming to shows years ago, and as I constantly remind her, was the reason she wasn't there that night. And here was Steve Martin, still itching for that hang time that for some reason we all crave, the togetherness we find in our loneliness, the bond we share with highs and lows, that's sacred only to us. It makes sense only to us. It's a trust we have in each other and in ourselves. Knowing that a guy who has reached the highest level of my business, still clearly believing in that bond, is something that reassured me how completely idiotic and important what we do is. I kept thinking, this is my chance. I'm gonna ask him for a job or to go to lunch or something. I couldn't just let him walk away. I mean, no one had ever meant more to me in the history of things. We got to the elevator. He turned back and said, very nice to meet you. I replied with my big time statement that was gonna change it all. Thank you. <laughs> he smiled and said, no, thank you. And as if on cue, the elevator doors closed but it left me just enough time to see one more annoyed look on Paul Simon's face. <laughs> You're welcome.